Welcome to everybody. Welcome to this uh, Montefiore lecture. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, hand over to Professor Sarah Pierce, member of the Parks Institute and head of the School of Humanities, and she will chair this evening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, it's a great honour to be asked to chair this um, lecture, which is given by a, a great scholar, but also I'm proud to say a good friend uh, in Charlotte Hempel. Um, so yes, I'd like to, on behalf of the School of Humanities, offer a very warm welcome to you all to the annual Montefiore Lecture in honour of Claude Montefiore. Claude Montefiore, who was born in 1858 and died in 1938, was a major theologian and founding leader within the movement of liberal Judaism in the UK. Montefiore helped to found the Jewish Religious Union in 1902, and he served as president of the World Union for Progressive Judaism from 1926 until his death. Montefiore was a noted philanthropist, but also a great scholar. He was a pioneer of interfaith dialogue, and he produced scholarship in abundance in the fields of ancient Jewish history and theology and its relationship with Christianity. Montefiore published particularly on the relationship between Judaism and the New Testament, writing some of the first Jewish commentaries on the Synoptic Gospels to be published in English. His most notable works include Judaism and St. Paul, published in 1914, a two volume commentary on the Synoptic Gospels in 1927, and Rabbinic Literature and Gospel Teachings in 1930. This remarkable theologian and educator was also the president of what was then University College Southampton from 1913 to 1934, the, the predecessor of our present University of Southampton. A Montefiore lecture was established in his honor in the 1950s, and it is the oldest established public lecture in our university's calendar. Indeed, it was in attending a Montefiore lecture that prompted James Parks to donate his library to Southampton in 1964. And this led to the establishment of the Parks Institute for the study of Jewish non-Jewish relations. The Parks Institute today is a community of scholars, archivists, librarians, students, and fellows whose expertise and interests span the disciplines of history, modern languages, music, archaeology, English studies and film. The Hartley Library of the University is home to the wonderful holdings of the Parks Library and Jewish archive collections, and also many books on Judaism, Jewish Christian relations and classics from Montefiore's personal collection. So our students and staff can borrow and take home the personal library copies of Montefiore himself. Tonight's speaker is Charlotte Hempel, Professor of Hebrew Bible and Second Temple Judaism and Head of the School of Philosophy, Theology and Religion at the University of Birmingham. Charlotte has published widely on the Dead Sea. You're muted, Sarah, for some reason. I was just muted then. <laughs> Uh, so, um, Charlotte has published widely on the Dead Sea Scrolls, including recently The Community Rules, a commentary published by Moa Zeebeck in 2020. And with George Brooke, she has uh, produced the TNT Clark Companion to the Dead Sea Scrolls, published by Bloomsbury in 2019. Charlotte was editor in chief of the prestigious Dead Sea Discoveries Journal from 2012 to 2018. In 2016, she served as president for the British and Irish Association for Jewish Studies. And more recently, she's been elected president for the Society for Old Testament Study for the year 2022. Charlotte is deeply committed to supporting the future of the field. And as such, she was founding director of the Second Temple Early Career Academy, a virtual common with global reach. We're enormously privileged to hear you speak tonight, Charlotte, on the Dead Sea Scrolls 
and the contours and texture of Palestinian Judaism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, for these kind words. And before I do anything else, I'm going to share my screen. I hope that's coming through at your end. Yes, perfect. Good. Okay, that's excellent. Um, it's really great to be talking to you all this evening. I'm delighted to see some familiar faces and names. And, and also delighted many people who I don't think I've met before. So it's really great to, uh, to have you come in at this hour, uh, wherever you are in the world. I'm very honored by Dr. Helen Sperling's invitation to deliver the prestigious Montefiore lecture here at the Park Center and grateful to Professor Sarah Pierce for her kind introduction. Claude Montefiore's seminal contribution that Sarah has alluded to also to serious Jewish engagement with the New Testament makes him a precursor of what I consider some of the most exciting New Testament research today, which comes from Jewish scholars. And I'm, I'm, I'm very delighted to see one very eminent scholar, uh, potentially in the Zoom room, and that's Professor Amy Jill Levine. So hi, AJ, if you are there. Um, first of all, what I want to try and do today to give you a little steer of where I'm heading is to flip perspectives Many, and perhaps some of you as well, would argue that the Dead Sea Scrolls belong in textbooks on the scrolls and tell us not very much about Palestinian Judaism more broadly. Several aspects of the literature and the geographical context where the scrolls were discovered contributed to an initial view that this was an important but rather idiosyncratic collection of texts that goes back to an ancient Jewish group of people who had turned their backs on the Judaism beyond. Scholars may hope that a diligent study of this material would bring us closer to this group, but ultimately should expect it to reveal very little of significance about Judaism beyond Qumran. The latter could almost be imagined, that is Judaism beyond Qumran, as a foil for anything expressed in the scrolls. Um, I meant to give you that wonderful image a little earlier, but I'll skip straight to my next one, uh, of the site. What I would like to offer is a fresh perspective by looking at Palestinian Judaism through a lens that draws on many decades of research on the Dead Sea Scrolls from the site of Qumran. This is heuristic, but does, in my view, throw light on what we know about the wider landscape of Palestinian Judaism. Not surprisingly, research that is cutting edge in one area often presents the discussion in relation to another area with something of a time lag. The evidence from Qumran tends to fall into that latter category, as do other areas, I'm sure, partly because of the explosion of new material to be published further fragments continuously identified and discussed even after additions had appeared, and the very technical nature of some of the nomenclature, it can be difficult to keep up with the cutting edge of research on the scrolls. It is worth noting, however, that both the texts and the scholarship on Qumran in broader brushstrokes and in specialist literature is now more accessible. And it would be remiss of me not to mention in this context the Companion, among other recent resources also available in this context. And Mike, I'm just singling you out just to make sure that you're watching and I've seen your name in the audience. Mike's one of my PhD students who did the indices for the Companion. And it's um, great that I think George is here too. Um, I also believe it is important to engage in the excitement and debate that is happening elsewhere. And there are certainly a lot of scholarly playgrounds where linear developments, dominant paradigms and watershed moments are challenged. It is in that spirit, my thesis is that it is worthwhile to look at other bodies of evidence and their scholarly assessment through the prism 
of reading of my reading of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Before I do that, let me turn to a number of studies on specialist areas that touch on the scrolls. Books on any number of big questions include a section, a chapter, or references to the Dead Sea Scrolls as important but rather marginal to the bigger picture that they are concerned with. Let me give you some specific examples of a series of important and excellent books, with my focus being on the pattern of stressing that particularism of the scrolls, highlighted in red on the slides, rather than the specifics in each case. And I was meant to flip that, let me start here. This example is the excellent monograph by Paula Fredrickson, one of the most exciting New Testament scholars on the New Test on the Jewish scholars on the New Testament. And to be fair, uh, she refers to the scrolls in her monograph on when Christians were Jews, the first generation. But when she does, and to be fair, so do most people, and it is quite legitimate to say the Essenes by the Dead Sea and the Qumran Covenanters. The references to the Essenes draws on evidence of particularly Philo, Josephus, and Pliny the Elder. While there are a number of striking correspondences between these classical authors and the scrolls, the latter authors also have their own tendence, their own particular um, line when they report on the Essenes, mainly to make themselves look rather good. So in what follows, I will therefore focus on the evidence of the scrolls themselves. This is a question of method and not de uh, denying that it is helpful to compare both of these sources. It is a case of being scientific and not contaminate one petri dish of words and ideas with another. Once we have done that, we can then compare results. And my second example is the volume by Timothy Lim, a monograph on the formation of the Jewish canon. That vol volume touches on the scrolls a number of times. And I was struck that Lim and I guess many others approach the evidence of the scrolls on the emerging Bible as the sectarian sense of authoritative scriptures. And as well as how, how yeah, so my sense is, I want to ask to what extent the evidence of the scrolls scriptures, their authoritative literature, to what extent is that actually sectarian? since the authoritative scriptures, many of them that we have in the scrolls, are shared with other later traditions, such as the Jewish community, various Christian communities, including the Ethiopic Orthodox Church, which shares literature such as Enoch with the scrolls. If all of these different communities share quite a large part of this literature, how can we therefore say that the oldest copies we have in the scrolls are sectarian uh, authoritative scriptures? And then my next example, my next two examples come from uh, Emmanuel Tov. Uh, first off, his monumental volume on the textual crit criticism of the Hebrew Bible, the forms of the text that we have. And Professor Tov distinguishes four different types of texts. Something that is Masoretic-like, or used to be called Proto-MT, which is the text of the medieval Masorets that forms the basis of most of the, the um, Hebrew Bible or Tanakh of today. The second is uh, labeled Pre-Samaritan, and he adds probably popular in Palestine, so we definitely have here a Palestinian witness, even on um, a wider Palestinian witness, even in Professor Tov's uh, categorization. Uh, and the Samaritans have particularly the Pentateuch, the Samaritan Pentateuch as their um, holy text. And then we've got texts, as Tov calls it, close to the Hebrew source of the ancient Greek version, the Septuagint. That's because the Qumran scrolls revealed Hebrew versions of the Bible that 
actually correspond to areas where the Greek had differed from the Hebrew. So we know that these ancient Greek translations did not necessarily alter the texts when they differed from the Hebrew, but they had a different Hebrew, which is very, very exciting. And the final cluster of texts that um, Professor Tov lists are non-aligned texts. Now in blue, my question is, has to be raised, and that's been raised by others as well. Where is the line or the norm beyond surprising pluriformity that is all co-located in this one place? If we have non-aligned text, we are assuming a line. In short, if all these witnesses were preserved in the scrolls side by side, we may conclude rather the Palestinian Jewish elites worked on other lines texts and all four categories would at this time best be considered fluid and unaligned. A prime example is the text of Jeremiah with at least one and possibly two versions of an ancient Hebrew forelager of the Greek. And the caves at the near Qumran also preserved the Hebrew, the proto-MT version of Jeremiah. Likewise, the, the Samaritan Pentateuch, we've got a text that resembles uh, the pre-Samaritan text type, and we also have um, other texts. So again, this fluidity is clearly material that we have coming out later in the tradition, and we know definitely it's all in Palestine in this one site, particularly the pre-Samaritan material, might suggest that this is actually taking us quite close to the sorts of texts we have in Palestinian Judaism. And my final example is another magnum opus by Professor Tov, and this time it's his volume on Qumran scribal practice, QSP, which is considered idiosyncratic. And I've given you a very important footnote that is included in Professor Tov's textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible, third edition, page 100, where he actually nuances the idea of Qumran scribal practice and explains what he means by it. And the key phrase here is, it's potentially misleading to say it's Qumran scribes who produced this, I highlighted in a um, oblong shape. This is a Palestinian scribal system, but it would be misleading to call these texts Palestinian, since that terminology implies there are no other Palestinian texts. The same, the name QSP, Qumran scribal practice, merely indicates a system, and here's a key phrase, mainly known from Qumran. That's a little bit of a refrain. Do we have to assume something mainly known from Qumran, given we don't know that much of primary material from that period, isn't also attested elsewhere? So again, we have uh, an area where, where others have suggested this is actually a, a Palestinian scribal practice that's attested right across, uh, and it's not necessarily unified either. And Professor Tov has, has, has nuanced his view here also. So given the quantity and variety of the Qumran evidence, I am inclined, therefore, to think that we have a good part of the evidence from Palestine represented here. I find it helpful to think of a window with curtains and to think about does Qumran have a window where we just have the curtain ever so slightly open and we see what we think is Qumran Whereas actually, if we were able to open that curtain further, we would realize it's actually much broader. Because the amount of material and learning that is in this one place is, is remarkable. Now, let me look at the second area, and that is evidence of the scrolls beyond particularity. The notion that the scrolls and the people responsible for them shed light on a very particular community and its secrets continues to grab our imagination. And to a certain extent, this is justified. However, alongside with this, we will explore a range of areas where the scrolls and the movement for responsible for curating them 
point to a closer relationship with their ancient Jewish contemporaries. A number of pieces of this body of evidence suggest the scrolls tell of a bigger story. Let me start with geography. Our concept of Qumran has for a long time had a narrow geographical focus, almost an archetypal remote place. Recent research paints much wide, wider vistas and suggests we need to allow for a more widespread network of localized manifestations of the movement. A fundamental issue concerns the revised chronology of the communal occupation of the site. In short, that has moved from 150 BCE to around 90 to 70 BCE as the period when a community settled at the site. This is the hypothesis explained and, and um, proposed by Jody Magnus and widely supported. So we're in the first century, in the first half of the first century, not in the second century. This means that a highly developed manuscript such as the community rule, 1QS, which dates from 175 BCE, um, was not composed at Qumran because it, it is a, a text that has a complex literary history. We know that because we have a great many versions of it, some of them potentially sources, in my view, of this manuscript. Um, even though some of them were copied later, it's very complicated. We can talk about that if you would like. Um, and Moreover, this text includes a penalty expelling a member of the community who has been a member for a full 10 years before betraying the community. Now, whether or not we can take this literally, it does, certainly does give us a sense of a community that's been around the block a few times and things are, have moved beyond the, beyond the idealized phase. They're, they're dealing with some issues. So this suggests the picture painted in this manuscript copied before, likely, or around the point of settlement, does not mirror a fledgling community. And wherever that fledgling phase of that movement occurred, it was not at Qumran. And that is very exciting, I think. The particularity of the site has been challenged from other directions as well. For instance, a number of what appeared to be distinctive archaeological features have now been discovered elsewhere. Over 1,000 individual dining dishes were recovered from a room at the, side of the Qum, at the site of Qumran known as the pantry on the left. And for a long time, this evidence was considered distinctive at a time when food was commonly served from larger shared bowls. However, the distinctiveness was diminished when around 3,000 individual bowls were discovered in a water installation in Hasmonee in Jericho. R ritual immersion pools likewise began to emerge in the first half of the first century in some number in Judea and Galilee. Um, however, they started initially in the Hasmonean palaces of Jericho. Rather than supporting a personal hygiene regime, such pools were used for full body immersion in order to achieve ritual pur purification. Jonathan Adler has recently argued, as well as others who have followed this line of argument, that these installations are Jewish responses to the Hellenistic hip bars. Between eight and 10, Ritual immersion pools have been identified at the relatively small site of Qumran, a remarkably large number in such a confined context. An intriguing and suggestive argument put forward by Cynthia Baker and Danielle Fatkin is that we have a case of keeping up with the Joneses, something I will return to below. Recent years have also revealed remains of, on Adler's reckoning, around 850 stepped pools in Judea, as well as Galilee. Dr. Joseph Scales offers a recent analysis in his Birmingham PhD on religious identity and spatiality in Hasmonean and Herodian Galilee. The great majority of these pools have been found in Judea with particular concentrations in Jerusalem. 
While precise figured, figures are debated, the overall trend of a mushrooming of such installations almost contemporaneously with the early occupation at Qumran seems uncontested. The evidence stresses the need to integrate the evidence from Qumran into contemporary trends regarding the construction of ritual immersion pools in late Second Temple Judea. Next, I'm going to talk about trans-local fellowship groups. Having evaluated features associated with the site, attested also elsewhere, it is worth remembering that the texts have always spoken of a geographical spread. In the Damascus document, we have references to a number of camps with an overseer in charge. And in the community rule, we have passages, particularly in column six, that talk about small fellowship groups meeting in all their dwelling places where one is found with their fellow. In every place where there are found 10, they shall exchange counsel. We also have references to together they shall eat, together they shall pray, and together they shall take counsel. And we also have a reference wherever there are 10, there shall be present a person who studies the law continually, day and night, one replacing the other. Um, smaller fellowship groups of this kind with shared interests likely preceded more complex community structures, such as the entry into the community over several years, which has a lot of concern with ritual purity and touching ritually pure solids and liquids. We have no indication of that in the small fellowship groups. In other words, the small scale gatherings refer to places where Torah was studied, prayers were shared, and the scriptures were debated. Such a shared purpose was not peculiar to the movement associated with the scrolls. A crucial witness is the Theodotos inscription, um, which in the opening lines is dedicated to Theodotus, Archisynagogos, and one of the dynasty of heads of the synagogue who built this first century synagogue. And crucially, the activities are described, the, the core activities as reading the Torah and teaching the commandments. There is little doubt, moreover, if we look at an interim conclusion on people, places and identities, there is little doubt that the ancient scrolls that have survived from Qumran offer an astonishing array of evidence on an ancient movement, including of trans-local fellowship groups. Our sense of the center of gravity of this movement was for a time closely linked to Qumran. This in turn led to a concept of the people and ideas behind these texts as somewhat marginal. Such a view has been challenged based on the occupation of the site, on the date of a text like the rule of the community. And we are now in a position to know a very good deal about ancient texts, including rule texts that were composed at locations unknown to us. Again, I find that quite exciting. Communal life presupposes purposeful social gathering to pursue shared activities by individuals whose ties to each other go beyond kinship and trade relationships. Social gatherings of this kind are also presupposed in scholarship on the emergence of the synagogue, as well as incipient Christian groups. In neither case should we think of a watershed moment for the emergence of social phenomena where a distinctive location to gather was identified at the outset. Moreover, the activities that we find in the Qumran rule are mirrored in the literature associated with the gatherings of early Christians and others. It is likely that precursors and pioneers behind various movements were geographically and perhaps socially closer than previously recognized. It is difficult to pinpoint the um, places where like-minded Jews, uh, like-minded Jews met prior to the move to Qumran. Similar debates are taking place also in relation to the meeting places associated with the origins of synagogues, the earliest beginnings, as well as early Christian gatherings and associations. So if you look at Lee Levine's book on the ancient synagogue and the introduction in the early chapters, 
he talks about a social phenomenon in the first place and buildings coming somewhat later. And um, unless in the diaspora, things started at a different time, but I'm, I'm now in, in uh, the Levant. And as well as for early Christian gatherings, Ed, Eddie Adams's book is really looking beyond houses. He's looking in all kinds of locations. And, um, and, and likewise, uh, John Kloppenberg's recent book on Christ associations looking at Christian gatherings in a heuristic comparisons to Greco-Roman associations is also very clear in this incipient phase that the particular place comes after the social people coming together. All three books emphasize this, uh, the fact that the location where was not an initially defining feature. So looking at Qumran backwards, in the way I've done beyond the site earlier, um, before the move to Qumran takes us, I think, to a similar position. It is likely, therefore, that incipient communal life reflected in the scrolls took place perhaps in proximity to gatherings by other Jewish groups. Such a scenario, perhaps partly inspired by Greco-Roman practices, would account for tensions as well as affinities between different bodies of evidence. In short, the synergies between the literary portrayals of gatherings across a spectrum of communities also reflect intersections of place and identity. I now want to say something about what is distinctive about the location and activities in the finds of Qumran, having just talked about things that are less distinctive. As we have noted, Immersion pools and individual dining dishes are not particular to Qumran, but have been attested at the Hasmonean palaces in Jericho and pools also in Jerusalem and elsewhere in Judea and Galilee, some in connections with agricultural settings. The earliest attestation of purity installations in an elite Hasmonean context is particularly intriguing. One way to explain these is as a response to Greek practices that led both Hasmonean elites and our Jewish reform movement, which is rather upwardly mobile as well, and quite wealthy, because designing a water system like that is not something you can do if you are poor, that led both of these groups to offer their own version of bathing practice. Thus, Albert Baumgarten has, has contextualized the immersion pool's uh, origin in the Hasmonean palaces as intra-elite competition. Uh, which is what I meant by saying keeping up with the Joneses. We all know what that's like. We might all slightly be doing that. It may not be about pools or kitchens, but we all have something, I, I imagine. Our assessment of the Qumran installations can also draw on Cynthia Baker's work on rabbinic literature, where she identifies the phenomenon of mimicking dominant cultural practices. And finally, my own colleague from Birmingham, Karen Rennell, has argued some time ago, you needed to be able to afford purity. It's a little like today, you need to be able to buy organic. You need to be able to, uh, you know, to purchase something that's much more ethically sourced. Uh, it's very, all very well to signal our virtue. And that would have been the same at this point. In fact, I've done a lecture on virtue signaling in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. Thus, while the motivations were undoubtedly very different, we can almost certainly attach the label elite to those who led the movement at Qumran and oversaw the installation of this water system. A striking confluence that we have perhaps not elsewhere like this are the number of inkwells, the materiality of the content of thousands of scrolls and fragments, and this literary flourishing. So to have all of this, um, literary material, evidence, as well as references to studying texts all in one place does seem to me to be distinctive. And perhaps the most distinctive aspect of the finds from Qumran is the co-location of a significant body of texts on ritual purity alongside a number of immersion pools over a and over a thousand individual dining dishes. We saw that we have the pools elsewhere and we have the dining dishes, but we do not have legal texts debating matters of purity alongside those material artifacts. This significant co-location 
of a rich literary engagement with the interpretation of the law and purity alongside the rich archaeological realia, such as the pools, would suggest we witness a grappling with identity that has left its mark on both texts and installations. Though it would seem not quite at the same time, some of these texts were brought there that refer to purity practices. Our analysis has shown that the movement's concern with ritual purity as reflected in the texts predates the move to Quran. Building on the work of Adler and others, we further argued that the purity installations reflect the desire to keep up with the Greco-Roman bathing tradition on the part of local elites. In this context, Ricky Bonney's suggestion that some of the archaeological features of the pools at Qumran, such as the sporadically attested divided stairways, reflect experimentation in design. This is something else you need to be able to afford to do. If you haven't got very much, you're not going to start experimenting. You're going to go, go with something cheap and cheerful that works, that you know that works. Put differently, the site of Qumran attests evidence of a scribal group of considerable means who created a material purity infrastructure to sit alongside their literary endeavors. When I say a group of means, I don't think that those were the only people there. I think in analogy with Downton Abbey, we have below stairs as well, people who probably did the menial work, uh, almost certainly. And uh, they are not really, they haven't really left to our knowledge, um, a mark on the remains. We can speak really of a state-of-the-art water system, the equivalent of what I'm told is a statement kitchen today. So you've got your statement water system in this apparently very poor, pious group. In short, our efforts at tracing the significance of the movement behind the scrolls can benefit from Switzerland and the CERN facility. Let us think less big band bang and more to expose on human and literary particles rubbing along in ways that are at first sight not easy to detect but which ultimately make up the basic constituents of matter in our case ancient Judaism thank you very much and I'm going to stop sharing Thank you enormously, Charlotte, for a really wonderful lecture, um, taking us over this very, very rich material, uh, both material uh, artifacts and also uh, the text themselves in such a, a really rich way. Um, we now have some time. Uh, Charlotte's generously agreed to take questions. Uh, so could I ask you either to put your question in the chat or if you could raise your hand to indicate that you would like to, to speak, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Hello, AJ. <laughs> I just saw your hello in the chat. Shall I kick off then? Uh, I don't think we've got any questions yet, have we, from anyone else yet, unless I'm missing them? No, no. No. Um, the bodies. The graveyard. Is there any, what, what, what's your conclusion uh, with regard to the, the bodies that were buried on the Qumran site and how they connect to the site and the, and the scrolls? Yeah. Um, the one interesting thing about it is that we've got 1,200 individual graves uh, with no grave goods in. And that was originally considered to be the sectarian practice at this site. However, since then, we have found a similar barrier of practices attested in Jerusalem, uh, in Kirbe Katsone, at ANL Gouver, and really excitingly, so there is a sense that perhaps these are. Uh, burials for poor people who couldn't afford to have a rock, rock tomb, tomb and all of this. But really exciting, this is what I'm thinking about the answer to your questions, and I'm, I've got to do more thinking, but the most exciting thing is a site in Transjordan, modern Jordan, called Kirbet Katsone, where around three and a half thousand graves from the first to the third centuries were found in a Nabataean cemetery. 
And I've just, I might have someone here who knows more about this than I do, but I'm beginning to look into connections to Nabataean practice in connection with the Edomian annexation of that territory. And I've, I've spotted something about other types of graves also, this area having been Judaized and there being some connections. So really, I'm never going to become an expert on Nabataean burial practice, but rather than trying to fix the Qumran thing, I'm now thinking we kind of need to know more about the Nabataean thing. One explanation for that, I can't remember who gave that, but potentially John Taylor, is it's a regional thing because it's in Jordan, but it's still in that sort of area. But I'm not sure. I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm trying to ask questions about it from the other side, a little bit like my whole paper. You know, we've always yeah. been looking at Quran to see what that really tells us about Quran. And then say, oops, oh, that, that, that's a bit similar, but that's not Quran. So starting from the other side might be helpful. Absolutely. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Rob Van Hoff. Um, are you familiar with Schneiderwin's recent work on language and group identity and his suggestion of, I think, SC inscribable practice rather than QSP? As in scribal practice, yes. Um, I, I am familiar with his work, and there is a really um, a great amount of very interesting work on the, on the language of the scrolls. Um, the, some people would say it's an idiolect, it's a particular way of speaking, because when we look at the scribal practices, some of those are connected with how certain things were pronounced. Um, but what is quite interesting, that again, it's not really that unified. We have a, a very interesting outlayer in MMT, which is uh, written in a Hebrew that resembles, well, I'm probably going to be shot down if there's any, <laughs> any experts on the language, but it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of debate. It resembles um, Mishnaic Hebrew. It has a lot more participles in it, etc. So I think you are absolutely right, uh, Rob, if I may call you by your first name. Um, that this language should be added into my observations because it is an area that we do have to connect. And um, I'm probably not the person to do that in its depth, but we have very interesting features. I give you one from my commentary on the community rule. We have a very well-known case where the teacher of righteousness is actually called the unique teacher at the end of the Damascus document where it is called Yahid. And we have an example in the community rule where, where I think it is Yakat again. But in any case, we have the same form. Uh, I can't remember the exact example now of that feature, but it's not in the Teacher of Righteousness. And that is a case where we have a linguistic thing that connects perhaps the, the way particular people spoke, because it could be down to the particular scribe, how they pronounce something. We don't know whether there was dictation, but even if there isn't, you kind of hear in your mind's eye. So I think you've raised something very important. Um, I'm also following all of that and thinking about what it might mean. But if I'm right, and I think I am, that the texts come, many of them, and the thinking behind them, and perhaps the speaking behind them, from other places, it is also explains why we have different scribal hands and different... Um, different ways of writing Hebrew and language, because the area was very multi multilingual and, and fluid. Um, so that would be my answer. I'm probably not the best person to give a lecture on that, but I've, I've had a go. Thank you very much for that. I see that AJ has got her hand up. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for a wonderful lecture. So one question on materiality and one question on method. On the materiality, to what extent do you think when you have mikvah oats um, or chalkstone vessels or anything in public space as opposed to private space, that that's a matter of your ergotism, that you have a donor who's providing this? And thus the question is not, is this group wealthy, but does it have a patron that has something to contribute to it? So to complicate a little bit the economic system, and on the method question, is, is part of the issue that those of us who work in, in, in the broader context of Second Temple Judaism having, is it the problem that we're stuck with the, the language of sectarianism 
with all the baggage that comes through and that we need a different term, uh, whether particularity or just distinction? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can start perhaps with, with the last question. I think you're right. I mean, we've probably, well, no, that would be an exaggeration. Have we written more about sectarianism as a thing than actually about the texts? I think this is moving in interesting directions all the time. And I think the most interesting directions actually come from uh, researchers on late antique Christianity, because identity there gets very, very complicated in this, you know, different context with Jews, pagans and Christians, and everybody is a little more um, sophisticated. People like Annette Reed, for instance, because with Qumran, because we thought, oh, here's, here's, the, here's their place, here's where they hang out, here's what they thought. We haven't been quite so sophisticated. We, we, we then talked ages about what kind of sect is it, and we got distracted by how we place it in Josephus rather than how do we place this evidence in its own context. So I think, I think you're right, but it is always very hard then to think of alternative ways of referring to the particularity um, and, and we can keep doing that and maybe each different attempt adds something. I don't think there is much of a complete definitive answer to anything that I've raised. You know, to have a view and express it carefully. And I noticed how careful Grubbenbott was in his book um, saying this is all heuristic. It gives us a different, it's very good by the way, imagination to think about things. So if I have just, you know, reached a different part of your imagination of what this could mean, um, and some of it, you know, may be right, but it is very hard to pin it down exactly. Uh, I like your, your point about public and, and patrons. Um, I'm not sure about a patron, but it could be that the, that the literati at Kuman in a way are the patrons of others who maybe had less because it's not just the wealth of building the installations, but of having had um, the education to read and copy and curate this literature, you must have been, you know, pretty elite in order to do that. And we've got a, a, a large range of literature. So I have before now described Qumran as Silicon Wadi, because in terms of intellectual um, copyright, you know, you've got um, apotopaic texts, you've got calendar texts, you've got all kinds of material, synchronizing calendars with all kinds of other things like um, particular rulers or festivals or uh, the priestly circles. You've got so much there of the learning of the time um, that I think there are other parts, even in the, lit the literary artifacts that show us um, that there is wealth. You might be right about the temple scroll. Though, because that is very curious, uh, AJ, and that could well be, you know, third century, who is to say, we don't really have an age, and it's made out of split parchment, and it's very, very luxurious item. We have no idea where that comes from, but you could imagine that that perhaps did have a particular, but when do you move from calling a wealthy owner who, who has something made or a patron? It's a very interesting question that I haven't thought about, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question in the chat uh, from Hannah KP. Uh, I thought your comment about Tov's category of so-called non-aligned text was really important, especially the idea of building conceptual categories around the idea of a norm. How should scholars address such categorical questions, i.e. drawing lines around groups of texts without rejecting classifications or adding additional divisions? Thank you very much, Hannah, uh, for your question. <clears throat> it's an excellent question. I've got, in a sense, I've got two answers. One is, uh, one of the first PhDs that I supervised was really the question of how do we talk about these texts that Tove talks about without the categories that we really take from a much later period. And, and he, um, his name is Dr. Drew Longacre. He's currently at the University of Groningen in Holland. And he wrote a PhD, not published yet, but hopefully soon, where he tried to uh, look at the local context at Qumran of 
text containing Exodus. And he then prepared each passage to Exodus texts in Qumran. And then he went to further in the Judean desert. So he, he worked it up a methodology of local context and slightly more distant. And then only lastly came to these later categories. Uh, and one thing I didn't really have time to incorporate, I think the texts must also go um, with communities. Now, I don't mean, though, that these texts are chosen. You know, we don't go into uh, Waterstones or Amazon in that period and just say which text of Jeremiah do I prefer. You know, your dad comes along and says, which one do you want to buy? Um, you wouldn't have any. Most people wouldn't have any. And if you did, you just have one that your teacher had or your father or your grandfather. So this element of choice, it has to be a place where these particular texts were. So it's tied in with the communities and people have worked um, in French medieval studies on textual community, um, a, a scholar called um, Stock that I've also used. So if we're looking at the community, I've played around for the purposes of tonight with using this proto language that Tove and others use for text with communities to make my case. So we could talk about proto-Pharisee, proto-Christian, pre-Samaritans, proto-Rabbis, and proto um, And actually all of this proto, they might not have been all distinct in that phase uh, and actually shared things in a way that actually still at Qumran, they shared different texts. They had the pre-Samaritan and all of that. So I think your question, Hannah, is very interesting, very hard to answer definitively, but I think we can kind of imagine that um, most people had very few choices here. And when we find different texts, it's likely because people were hanging out in these translocal communities. But also Qumran people um, had a number of those, presumably from different translocal communities. So it does tell us it's a very special place that perhaps gives us, even on that one site, with the literature it has, a picture that is with the curtain wide open. Wonderful images you're giving us here, Charlotte, um, really bringing it to life. Uh, Helen, Helen Sperling has a question. Hi, Helen. Hi, Charlotte. Thank you so much for that. It was absolutely wonderful and really, really rich. Um, I, I really um, have, I suppose, quite a basic question. I'm just really interested in what um, you were saying about one QS not being composed at Qumran, um, which is something I guess I'm very behind on my on my Dead Sea Scrolls research but I wonder if you could say um, a little bit more about the arguments behind that what you see the implications being for our understanding of that particular text yeah yeah so we basically got a number of manuscripts of the community rule and 1QS is the first one that we found in cave one it is 11 columns it's meters long and it's 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 relatively carefully put together but the exciting thing is in cave four, another cave, um, we found other manuscripts of the same text and some of them are actually older. Um, there are two papyri and one of them is definitely dated to 150 and another one uh, potentially as well. And um, some people thought that 4QSA, this old papyrus manuscript, I think it was potentially um, Philip Alexander, so that may have been a draft copy of the papyrus of the whole 1QS, but actually most people agree that the first four columns, an introduction, the covenant ceremony, and the teaching on the two spirits, uh, came later. And I have suggested it's potentially the case that this 150 BC old papyrus is a draft of the beginning, because we know that the middle stuff, which is all the rules and regulation, is also in two other man in one other manuscript on its own. It doesn't start with the first four columns. And but that copy of that is later, but we think that's a later copy of an earlier source. So we basically know that this text was put together in various stages, and some of the earliest ones are from 150. Um, so this tells you we could be anywhere. And I'm just thinking that's fantastic. I mean, I spend a lot of time in K4 in my head. I'm now in ancient Palestine and I'm thinking, this is fun. <laughs> so 
So I don't know what you think. Be interested to hear how that lands. With, you might be really disappointed and I might just have really destroyed the very reason that you came to hear the talk, but um, I hope not. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can um, take privilege of chair again and ask you a question. One of the big things that was debated long ago in, when I was a student was to do with the calendar and Qumran. Is that still a really important issue? Because that was seen as, as a key feature of the sectarian identity of the community. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the real thing with Kanvadi these days is... Um, is my colleagues who really understand the calendar. And, and they have different views about it because there was this sense when we first met Sarah um, in the Oxford seminar that Geza chaired, uh, that the Kumran calendar was very clearly a solar calendar and not a lunisolar calendar. But then when all the calendar texts were published, there was some alignment in them, in some of them, with the movements of the moon. So we thought, well, I was quite excited thinking it's more pluriform but there is a fantastic scholar at Tel Aviv University called Eshval Ratzon, and she uh, is thinking again and explaining that in a much more technical way that it really still is solar calendar, if I understood correctly. So my point is, what I'm interested in is looked at, having looked at the community rule and finished my commentary, which ends with a hymn at the end, uh, and the maskil, the wise leader, talking about praying. For me, the most exciting thing about that calendar is that it all goes back to Genesis and the creation of the heavenly bodies, and that really we are all connected with the movements of these heavenly bodies and the prayers at different times. So I think it is really... Um, that explains to me why one of the community who manuscripts that doesn't have this hymn has a calendric text, because even the hymn starts with times for prayer and tying in prayer with these um, movements of light and darkness and the heavenly bodies. I think in antiquity, there's no TV. I mean, we would not have any light and we wouldn't be talking. But we would notice the skies and there was a sense, you know, we depended on them for rain. We still do. Actually, we are seeing it much more now with floods, etc. Those skies are coming back. I mean, we thought we'd made it, you know, with all of our technology. But we are actually entering a space of fear and being completely helpless and looking at our skies and hoping electricity is coming back. Parts of uh, of Yorkshire have been without for a long time. So actually, it's quite interesting. I usually say, oh, it's a completely different world. You know, you actually take notice of uh, of the skies. And a lot of people do, of course, take notice of the skies. But I think there was this sense of it actually not being a calendar thing, an intellectually an intellectual thing over there. It was really something that concerned everyone. And you were working. And there's a really interesting uh, argument by Jeremy... Uh, my colleague, um, I can't remember his surname now, but it's a brill book on prayer at night time where he makes the argument that the night time was considered particularly dangerous for attacks of demons, etc. And that prayer um, is used as a sort of defense mechanism, which makes sense of the Qumran people spending time at night reading the scriptures, etc. So... Um, not a perfect answer to your calendar question, but I think I got away with it. What do you think? I know, so it's a wonderful answer, and I'm completely at sea when it comes to the, the really detailed discussions about it. So you've been brilliantly lucid. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions? If not, we have gone past the hour. Um, so it remains for me to say an enormous thanks on, on my part and, and for humanities to you for a really splendid lecture, a fantastic tribute to Claude Montefiore. Uh, I could imagine, although he died sadly before the scrolls were discovered, that he would be absolutely in there, intrigued uh, about 
their significance. Um, so I'm going to pass over now to Claire Lafol, uh, the director of the Parks Institute, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And just to add to Sarah's thanks, it was really a, a, a fantastic lecture. And thank you for all this insight into the Qumran site and its archaeological features. We were really privileged to, to hear about your research. So thank you so much for, for being here tonight. And thank you, uh, Sarah, for, for sharing and for Pleasure. also giving so much of your your expertise and knowledge and understanding of the topic and also for supporting the, the Parks Institute and the, the Montefiore lecture. And thank you finally to Helen Sperling for suggesting to invite Charlotte. I'm very grateful to her as well. So I will just say uh, a few words about our next event, which will be after Christmas. So it will be uh, our PhD roundtable discussion on the 18th of January about organizing collaboration with the Jewish Museum London. And we will have basically two PhD students talking about the documents they found in the special collections in Southampton, it will be Jennifer Craig Norton, who will talk about kinder transport, and Katie Power, who will talk about her research on uh, London Yiddish theater and the documents she found in the archives. It will be an online uh, event, but we are hoping actually to live stream from the uh, Jewish Museum London and the special collections and uh, Karen Robson, the director of the special collections will be there and also uh, Fran, the director of the Jewish Museum London. So you can already book, it's on the website and we will also have an HMD event, so Holocaust and Genocide Memorial um, day event on the 26th of January co-organized as every year with uh, Solent. So we are hoping to hold it hybrid, but it might shift of course to online. Thank you all for coming tonight. Have a lovely evening. Keep safe, keep well, uh, and have all a uh, good, well, restful holiday. Um, and we'll see you in the new year. Thank you. Thank all. you very much, thank Claire. You. And thank you very much, Charlotte. Thank you. And thank you very much, everyone.